I remember I got badly beaten up on my first day of school, <laughs> which was like, there was a kid in the line in front of me that had this really cool Afro that I thought looked so cool that I was like, I wonder what that feels like. And I went to touch it, you know, and he turned around and smacked me really hard. Robert is a highly successful entrepreneur, best-selling author, prolific inventor, and founder of numerous enterprises spanning healthcare, clean energy, social media, and financial technology. As an artist, sculptor, music theorist, and musician, Robert's creative abilities are equally impressive. Oh, I'm a general contractor, I'm a mathematician, or I'm a scientist, or whatever it is that you've chosen your area of expertise to be. You guys probably aren't gonna love hearing what I'm gonna say, but I'm gonna tell you several examples of how our governments are corrupt. And I got like a standing ovation. And I thought for sure people were gonna be like, oh, we're not gonna invite him back. Here I am speaking to a government yeah. group, right? And actually I ended up getting way more invitations wow. every time I said crazy stuff like that. The things that we judge in other people that we don't like in others, are really just the things that we don't like about ourselves that we repress and suppress from anyone else seeing, most importantly, ourselves. The Avenue of the Strongest is a podcast dedicated to exploring the lives and experiences of the most inspiring individuals from around the world. Each episode features interviews with fascinating guests who share their insights and wisdom on a variety of topics, including education, impact, motivation, health, and learning. Here are your hosts, Aniette Chowdhury and Vlad Suleiman. Welcome to the Avenue of the Strongest. Today, we are honored to have with us an inspiring and multi-talented individual, Robert Edward Grant. Join us today as we explore his fascinating journey and the wisdom he has gained along the way. Robert, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Great to be here with you. Your, your professional background is incredibly diverse, <laughs> ranging from leading corporations in the medical field to founding your own growth equity holding company. Uh, what inspired you to pursue such a multifaceted career? This podcast is sponsored by Argo Prep, an award-winning edtech company serving over a million students nationwide. We understand that as parents, you want to ensure that your child receives the best education possible. Say hello to Argo Prep. With over 15 plus educational awards earned in just the past year, Argo Prep's platform offers your child video lessons, quizzes, drills, printable worksheets, and more. Best of all, your Argo Prep subscription comes included with four comprehensive digital workbooks that cover all four subjects math, ELA, science, and social studies. Visit argoprep.com today and start your free trial. I think it was just uh, probably something that came out of my interests that were very diverse in general. I, I always rejected this notion of being pigeonholed into one or two areas that were very narrow in their orientation. I had lots of interests. The reason I didn't go to law school was because even though I was interested in law, I didn't want to only be a lawyer in my lifetime. Mm. Uh, I also loved medicine. And so I thought, well, geez, how can I be you know, both involved in medicine and healthcare and cutting edge technologies uh, without having to actually be a doctor. And, mm. and so I was able to weave all of these different aspects together. And whenever people would kind of say, okay, you know, let's go specialize more, you should go specialize more and more, I would kind of reject it. And I kind of cut my own path and said, you know, I, I, I'd rather stay and remain broad, which was hard to do. It was very hard to do because we have so much pressure in society, I think, pushing us towards hyper-specialization in general, particularly in academics. And, and so I really kind of had to reject it uh, on its face and, um, and then decide, you know, and it, it became challenging on many levels because when people ask you what you do, it's hard to just give a simple answer. You know, it's like, oh, I'm a, you know, I'm a contractor, a general contractor, or I'm a mathematician, or I'm a scientist, or whatever it is that, you know, you, you've chosen your area of expertise to be. In my case, you know, I'm equal parts uh, musician, uh, mathematician, um, artist, uh, geometer, uh, physicist, I'm like all those different things. And I've been able to, and also an entrepreneur and creator, I've been able to sprinkle different aspects uh, and look at things differently because, especially within specialties, because of that broad background. I could take learnings from one area and apply it innovatively to another area that's not 
at least on its surface, seemingly connected at all. Hmm. But actually, everything's connected. Robert, I was actually listening to some of your podcasts just before this. I went out for a walk. It's incredible the 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 information that you have. It's 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 incredible. I'm going to get to that in just a second. But what I mm-hmm. didn't find was uh, a host yet, and it probably is out there because you know you have a lot of videos out. Uh, I'd love to learn a little bit more about your childhood. You know how you grew up, uh, 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 things like that. Instead of before we kind of go into the, the math question that I have. Sure. You know I was uh, <laughs> I grew up. Uh... You know, it's kind of like that movie that uh, was with Steve Martin, where it's like, I, I grew up a poor white child type of thing. Um, you know, I'm a part Asian, so I was a mix, and I was born in Texas. And, uh, you know, even though I thought I looked pretty similar to everybody else, I, I guess people thought I didn't look similar at, th- at that time. Nowadays, I think I'd be, like, completely boring, right? No, nothing new here. But, um, but I remember we moved to Louisiana when I was five years old. and. Um, I ended up getting bussed. It was during the whole segregation thing. I ended up getting bussed to an all black school. <laughs> and I had been in this, you know, neighborhood where it was all like white kids. And then I got bussed to an all black school. And I remember I got badly beaten up on my first day of school, <laughs> which was like horrible, but it was actually my own fault because there was a kid in the line in front of me that had this really cool Afro that I thought looked so cool. That I was like, I wonder what that feels like. And I went to touch it, you know, and he turned around and smacked me really hard. And <laughs> so that was my last day in that school. But, um, <laughs> but you know, I think that's a good example of probably the path my life has taken, where I always went the place that nobody else went, wanted to go into. You know, if a, if a movie mm-hmm. theater was on fire, everyone's running out of it. I'm the guy running in with the water hose, right? And wow. yeah. And that was always my philosophy in life. I always took big risks. And and my father was in the Air Force, so we moved to England. And I grew up in the UK from the time I was seven until 14 years old. And I got to travel all around Europe. I got to go visit so many different countries and, and learn about so many different cultures. That was an education in and of itself. And I became infatuated with history because I felt like history, at least, you know, it doesn't give you a clear indication of the future, but it's probably the best indicator that we have of what the Mm. future might bring for us. And a lot of things happen in cycles. And I started noticing cycles. You know, I remember reading Plato's Republic when I was in high school. And there he talks about, that's his uh, treatise really on the the different evolution of government. And Mm. I was always interested in government as a child and the notion of it and how he called out all forms of government uh, pretty much in the Republic that we would look at today is pretty remarkable and how it cycles. It all cycles. You know, we go through these different cycles of thinking that we're, you know, needing to be in today, we're in a republic. And then the republic often will transition into democracy that becomes more mob rule oriented. And then anarchy is not far behind it, right? So all of these things, and anarchy, a lot of people think that that means that, you know, there's no government and no organization and no structure, which is sort of like making us all conjure images of a free-for-all, right? But actually, it is a viable method, and it's just something we haven't really studied as a possibility. And I think that technology might actually help us to, to move to another paradigm of what we see as government, because I think we've seen that our governments today, and this was exactly called out by, by Plato as well, are terribly corrupt, And they're corrupted because we have all of this agency built into the system. Right. We don't have a true democracy. And what we have is a republic, which we have representative democracy. And in that agency is where a lot of the corruption occurs. I was invited to give a speech to the United Nations, uh, the CEO summit that they had in September last year. And I got up and I said, you guys probably aren't going to love hearing what I'm going to say, but I'm going to tell you several examples of how our governments are corrupt. And I got like a standing ovation. <laughs> and I thought for sure people were going to be like, oh, we're not going to invite him back. Here I am speaking to a government <laughs> group, right? And, yeah. and actually I ended up getting way more invitations every time wow. I said crazy stuff like that, you know? And and because people are like, yeah, that resonates. Geez, that's kind of amazing. You know, and and looking at the world in different ways. 
You know, we all want to follow science for sure, but right. let's, let's be sure not to fall into scientism. Mm. Scientism becomes another religion where mm. you can't even question the science. Yeah. And I think this is what's happening in large part in academia. And I think it's incumbent on teachers who are teaching our young people today to start to, you know, kick back against this because I started thinking about it as a CEO of publicly traded companies, as a healthcare, you know, executive, I can tell you right now, I've worked with lots of scientists in my entire career. And one of the big challenges that I identified, and I've had thousands of them employed under my organizations. I've had thousands that I've worked with in different capacities. I can't think of a single case where someone who was a scientist, at least a self-proclaimed scientist, was willing to speak out against anyone who funded their research mm. or who they wanted and hoped would fund eventually their research. Mm. And this in and of itself is problematic. And then when I have met scientists who are willing to do that, then the organizational structures on top of them, the hierarchies that are above them, immediately stop them from doing it and practically ban them. <laughs> so I think there's a, a big issue going on in society right now where it's almost like, we only hear what we want to hear, and we're stuck in an echo chamber of our own conditioning biases. And this is in part because of AI, because wow. AI knows what's going to get you the highest dopamine hit. And that's when you go into a chat room where everyone agrees with you. So then you end up at an, at an election time where inevitably half of society is polarized in one direction and half is polarized in the other, and everyone's shocked when their candidate doesn't win. Because how could it be when everybody agrees with me in all my chat rooms on social media, how could it be mm -hmm. that there's anyone who disagrees with me? And I think this is what we're dealing with in society right now. We're sort of waking up to this reality of this highly and hyper-polarized societal structure that I think is a direct result of hyper-specialization. Hmm. Because wow. we've lost the ability to empathize and listen and put ourselves in other people's shoes and understand that their perspective, you may not agree with it, that's fine, but you have to at least recognize that there's value to looking at things in different ways. How can teachers push back on this? You know, uh, I don't know if you've seen this whole thing where you know people are talking about misinformation and social media, and so the news agencies all release this one sort of taped uh, response to all of this from every single news agency in the country, and it was the exact same scripted language, Okay, we which was all... precisely what they were hoping to try to get away from in the first place. There's, there's a certain thing. It's like uh, one of my favorite movies was Batman Begins. Do you remember Batman Begins? It had Christian Bale in it. Yeah. And it's the one that had Two-Face, right? And there was a point in the movie where he says, hope that you live long enough to defeat the villain, but not so long that you actually become the villain. This is what happens to us. The things that we judge in other people that we don't like in others are really just the things that we don't like about ourselves that we repress and suppress from anyone else seeing, most importantly, ourselves. They're the things that we deny in ourselves. So we, we tend to then attract everything we've been judging until we stop judging everything we attracted. And I mean negatively judging it. Hmm. So what happens in society is very often the thing that you're trying to fight against. So right. let's say you're fighting in favor of more tolerance from a societal perspective. Okay. And so you're going to push the notion of what tolerance is as far as you possibly can. Push the envelope on what tolerance is. So much so that eventually you become the thing that you're basically intolerant of is is intolerance. So you actually can get to the imp of the perverse, right? Where you push something all the way to the edge. And this is what I started noticing. A lot of the stuff that I thought was opposite in society, like right. communism and fascism, looking at different governance models. And then right. I started thinking to myself, well, can I even think of one example where a communist regime that was billed as a communist regime didn't actually become a fascist totalitarian state? And I couldn't wow. think of even one example, not even wow. one. So this is where you start to realize the things that you're fighting for, very often you can end up becoming the opposite of that thing without even realizing that it happened. Yeah. What, 
what is what does an anarchy government system look like possibly well i think that we're on the precipice of a period of time where we could contemplate this which i guess in a way is good news the reason why we could contemplate it <laughs> well it's probably bad news that we're even willing to contemplate it because <laughs> it's like that tells you how screwed up things are right, right it must be right. really jacked for us to be thinking about well what about no government as a model hmm <laughs> Well, I think that one of the things that I really like about blockchain technology and the, the purpose right. that I saw in blockchain right from the very beginning was a potential for a new governance. Because blockchain already in, inhabits within that a new type of governance with its node validation system. Okay. So one of the problems we have in society is how do we nail down an objective truth? Is there such a thing as an objective truth? That's a tough question. It sounds easy, especially for educators. But in point of fact, is it really easy, though? So if there are 30 people that are eyewitnesses to a shooting, how many different reports are we going to get that are going to be likely very, very different from every other report? Right. 30. And this happens all the time. One of my closest friends is the was the founder and CEO of Discovery, which is a, a group that does mock juries. And so they have to deal with this issue all the time, that people mm -hmm. don't see the world as it necessarily is. They see the world as right. they are. Right, right. So I think one of the most important things is to teach our youth to start seeing the world from outside of their own shoes. And in so doing, they can start to connect more with themselves. Because the, when you only see everything from one point of perspective, then the risk is that you could be easily become narcissistic. And narcissism mm -hmm. is not true self-love. It's not self-love. It's actually self-loathing for all the aspects of yourself that you want to deny exist. Mm -hmm. And you're the only one that can't see that. And that's why we have things called 360 degree reviews in corporations. Mm -hmm. So we can teach people to increase their self-awareness. The one thing that drives higher and higher success than anything else in any educational environment is to teach children, young adults and adults, higher self-awareness. The most self-aware people are the ones that have breakout success. They don't have to be the smartest. They don't have to be the best from a skill set perspective. They simply have to have and engage the highest self-awareness because they, they can match their intention with their outcomes. So intention can now equal impact. Mm. And that's a very, very different way of looking at the world, right? So I think by teaching people to look really hard at circumstances, and without judging them, try to analyze first, what are all the different ways of seeing this? We could say maybe that objective truth is really just the sum of all possible subjective perspectives. Hmm. Wow. Uh, how, how, how do we teach you? How do we teach kids or youth to question everything? Because I think this is the base to question everything if it's if it has other sides of their people. I think one of the ways that it's so critical to teach youth is going to be modeling example. Okay, so the best way to teach, you know, it's like this. In my companies, I have this thing where I say, you know, no menial task is beneath any one of us. Okay. So if I walk out in the main area and I find like a bubblegum wrapper on the floor, I could say to somebody else, hey, pick this up right? Please pick it up. But that wouldn't actually be as effective as me just picking it up myself. 100%. And why do you think that is? Why is CEO, that? CEO, that's... It's, yeah. You're, you're, you're modeling. You're doing the modeling. Yeah. Without saying a single word, I've just told everybody else what's important to me. It's important to me to maintain a clean office environment. Yep. And be organized. I mean, and so... If I walk by again and there's a bubblegum wrapper that's there and the person that was sitting closest to it didn't pick it up but had seen it, then they're feeling like, uh-oh, I probably should have been the one to pick that up. <laughs> yeah. So modeling example 
is the most powerful tool for learning. And if we are sitting here trying to tell people that we want to foster and create an environment where people can challenge narratives, then we have to be willing to take those challenges. We have to be willing to get offended. And in today's society, everyone gets so easily offended over everything. And here's the truth. If you get offended by people, what they say and what they do, you have to ask yourself for a moment, is it you that's the problem? Maybe you're perceiving it in a way. Now, clearly, there's going to be cases where maybe what was said was offensive. But in society, for society to work and function correctly, you cannot suppress every part of communication in society. You will kill the ability to challenge narrative. And this, and this is, exactly is what's what happening right with now. council culture. Council yep. culture right now. Now, look, I'm, yep. not, I'm not conservative. I'm not Republican. I'm not Democrat. I'm, star, I'm very, very, very much a indep independent. Because I don't vote based on party. I vote based on policy. I vote based on candidate. And I think what's happened is we get so stuck in the same notion of scientism. And it could be dogmaism, right? It's any kind of dogma. Mm -hmm. Right. Where the established narrative cannot be challenged. I agree. I agree with you 100%. It is being increasingly difficult to challenge a narrative because if you challenge it, you're an outcast. To oh, society. you get canceled. You get canceled. You get kicked time. off of social media. Yep. Yep. Right. I mean, Robert, it is what it is. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it is, but. That is very harmful to us as a society overall. Oh, and we wonder why suicide rates are so high. I mean, it was hard enough being in high school with just like all the petty stuff that happens in high school. Mm. Now expand that and multiply it exponentially. And then you've got something we call this social media experiment that we just all assumed that we could adopt and no problem. Mm. And now add on top of that AI and algorithms that are basically cattle prodding people into different conditioning bias chambers. Yep. Thus decreasing their ability to empathize with others and making Thanksgiving dinner a, a hell a hell night. <laughs> and how is it different with, with, with other cultures, with other governments? U.S., let's say, and England. I think any Asia. dogma that doesn't allow open discussion and free debate is, is going to become a culture cancellation dogma. I think mm -hmm. it's going to become a culture war. It reminds me of Mao Zedong in, you know, the, the 40s and 50s in the Cultural Revolution, right? And, you know, or Stalin. You know, 100 million people were killed. A lot of people that sit here and say to me, oh, I think communism's the answer. It never got a real shot. I'm like, dude, go back and look at the entire 20th century. What are you talking about? Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of our current government system. I'd rather, you know, I'm more libertarian, I guess, in that sense. And I probably would say, hey, well, let's try the one we haven't tried yet. No government. How's that? Because I don't get anything for it. And I pay for it. And all right. I get is kind of agitation and grief. And then everything is a game. It's kind of like, you know, the fall of Rome, where it's like the emperor comes out and says, oh, we're going to issue games, you know, for everyone, and we'll give them bread and wine at the games. It's like the craziest stuff ever right now. It's whatever will get them elected is what the, the moment of urgency is about. And to me, that's just not a way to go. And, you know, I think we all probably fall into this problem area, which is, you know, recognizing we just don't see it. We're not self-aware enough to realize that the way we've been seeing the world all along was what we thought was our point of vantage. And actually it's our point of advantage. Robert, I want to slightly shift things uh, a little bit because mm -hmm. you are such a fascinating, uh, you have such a fascinating story, the research, the pub, the papers that you've been publishing. So you have an impressive portfolio of patents and IP in a wide range of fields. Uh, I, I want to go. So my question is, 
how do you approach innovation and discovery across these different areas? But I want to be more specific. So, for example, in 2019, you published a paper, Accurate and Infinite Prime Prediction from uh, Novel Quasi-Prime Analytical, Analytical Methodology. Mm-hmm which is prime numbers previously were thought to have no apparent pattern as they appear within the infinite string of numbers in such a random fashion. However, one of the things that you discovered in this paper was the pattern of 24, which squaring any prime number will always result in a multiple 24 plus one with the exception of two and three. I'm trying to like wrap my brain around this. How do you... How did you recognize that pattern? I mean, what was that process like? Can you give, can you share us a, sure. a little bit of insights mm-hmm. over here with us? Sure, absolutely. And why you and why you even started? Why did I even start <laughs> looking at it? That's that's probably the bigger question, right? It's like, <laughs> what were you thinking? Um, you know, it's funny because I think the first thing, the reason why I started looking at it was because one of the companies in our portfolio was a company called Taurus Tech. And I was working with the team of physicists, which was kind of a hobby of mine. And I really enjoyed it. And we're trying to tackle a greater understanding of how gravity might interact with electricity. Okay. Okay. And so I believe that um, everything in the universe comes down to numbers. Uh, I believe that Pythagoras was right in this. I believe Plato was right in this. All is number. So if all is number, then there must be some representation in particle physics that relates to numerical values. And from this, we created a model, that was a theorized model, which was associated with number theory. It's sort of a number theory approach to particle physics. And in this context, in this context, the vacuum is one, right? And it's also what we would call gravity, right? Mm-hmm. So it's combined with both. Uh, the number two is electricity in its positive polarity. The number three is an electron. The number four is uh, what I would call the positive pole of magnetism. The number five is the negative pole of magnetism. The number six is a proton. The number seven is the negative pole of electricity. And the number eight is a photon. And the number nine is a neutron. Okay. Now, what I found fascinating by this is that two and five, I noticed, had properties that were sort of like mirror reflective relationships with each other. One was electromagnetism. The other was the other one was electricity. The other one was magnetism. Those are just 90 degree, you know, offsets from each other in Maxwell's equations Mm -hmm. from an electromagnetism perspective. And then I also noticed that uh, one over two is equal to 0.5 and one over five is equal to 0.2. So they have kind of this mirroring property already inherent in the numbers. Mm -hmm. And then I noticed as well that four and seven had similar properties. So four has the same shape as seven, just as two has the same shape as five. It's just upside down, backwards and opposite. So think about the shape of a number five, think about the shape of a number two. That's kind of amazing that it somehow perfectly mirrors reciprocity. One over two equals 0.5. And what about four? One over four equals 0.25 and two plus five equals seven. So this property exists across numbers. And then we've got this three, six, and nine numbers. And the way a six looks, looks like it has centripetal force. The way we even draw it goes in inward. And the way we draw a nine goes outward, right? It's going spiraling out versus spiraling in. Mm -hmm. Isn't that how we would think about possibly a proton and a neutron? And then Mm -hmm. even the shape... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of the pathway of an electron as it travels from the North Pole of the Earth through its magnetosphere down to the center of the Earth and creating a double torus shape. That's the shape of a number three. And those are electrons that travel, travel that path. That's kind of remarkable. What a coincidence, right? It's all coincidental. Yeah. So I started thinking, well, maybe there's something more to how we think about consciousness. Maybe there's something deeper in how this world is constructed around us that relates back to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and double slip phenomenon and what we consider, you know, the spooky action at a distance in quantum physics. And in that context, I started thinking about what would be the numerical pattern associated with 24-ness. Okay, and why 24? Well, 24 has a unique property. First of all, if I take the square root of 10 divided by 10, 
plus one, and then put all of that in parentheses and take it to the power of one over 0.24, it equals pi. A really close approximation for pi. And Ramanujan, who you probably heard of, is a famous mathematician who was from India, a Vedic mathematician, who was largely not formally educated until he went to Cambridge to get his PhD, but now today recognizes in the top five greatest mathematicians of all time. A lot of his work was based on 24-ness. And there's a mm -hmm. geometric structure that relates to this 24-ness, and it's this. This geometric structure is called a cube octahedron. It's the central geometric form of the Archimedean solids. Now, if I flatten this and I put it in two dimensions, those 24 edges of this structure, because it has 24 edges, will mm -hmm. become a mod 24 analysis. So then I started noticing, well, what other things can I find related to 24-ness? Well, all Fibonacci numbers, when viewed in digital root mathematics, repeat every 24 numbers. So digital root just means like, you know, we have 1 plus 1 equals 2, 2 plus 1 equals 3, 3 plus 2 equals 5, and then the next Fibonacci number would be 8 because 5 plus 3 equals 8. You're just right. adding the last two numbers. And then right. the next one is 13. But then in order to get the digital root on that, we have to take it down to one digit. So 13 mm -hmm. becomes 4. 1 plus 3 equals 4. Yeah, right. The next right. number is 21, so the next number is 3. The next number is 34, so the next number is 7. Right? So 34 is just 3 plus 4 equals 7. And then it goes, uh, you know, 34, 55, 89, 144, 233. And 144 becomes the 12th Fibonacci number, which also is interesting because 12 times 12 equals 144. So there's mm. patterns in this clearly, right? It can't right. just be all coincidence. Right. And then I noticed something even more important, which is that every prime number above the number three had the same property in that if you square it, it will always be a multiple of the number 24 plus one without exception. It's amazing. <laughs> so five times five is 25. That's one times 24 plus one. Seven times seven is 49. That's two times 24 plus one. 11 times 11 is five times 24 plus one. And 13 times 13, right, is seven times 24 plus one. And this will go infinitely without exception. So yep. I found that there must be a 24-ness. A lot of people were focused on reductionism much further down because they wanted to see the patterns based on plus and minus one from the number six, so multiples of six. Mm -hmm. But the pattern doesn't show its fullest expression with what we would call quaternity, right, mm -hmm. or quaternions, until we could see it in 24-ness, which is what the pattern mm -hmm. was of all primes above the number three. But as I just told you, right, they're all multiples of 24 plus one. So right. from that, I started analyzing all the numbers on mod 24, to see what common denominators I could find, what are the things that, you know, that create pattern in these areas that we tend to have been thinking that they might be just random. And I don't really believe in randomness. Yeah. I just believe that what we call randomness is just our inability to perceive a higher pattern. And, yep. and that's really the better way to say randomness or entropy is just to call it ignorance. You know, before mankind discovered the relationship between a diameter and a circle, you could say that mankind was ignorant. And so it, he thought that he, she thought that the relationship between a diameter and a circle was unknown. That could be random. Right. And when in reality, it's not. When in reality, it's not. Right. So couldn't we say that about literally all of science? Yeah. That at some point in time, mankind stared up in the sky and yeah. said, oh, it's all random. That doesn't make any sense. Yep. And then someone came back and said, no, 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 we found a pattern there. And every time we find a pattern, and we call that pattern a constellation, and maybe it starts off as some myth. Maybe it starts off as some sort of mythical or mythos kind of uh, constructual way to look at the world around you. And we say, oh, the gods associate with this, or it's Cassiopeia or whatever, right? These are the stories that go along with the stars in the night sky. So what we thought was previously random was now no longer random. And every time we discover something new in mathematics, we're just pushing the boundary of our ignorance farther and farther away from us. Right. And I think that's what's happened. So I looked at it and I said, okay, if there's going to be a relationship between gravity and electricity, 
what could it be from a number theory perspective? And I started looking at all the numbers that were prime. So on mod 24, all the numbers that were prime, I marked as red. And all the numbers that were not prime, I marked as green. And then I wanted to find the relationship between those numbers. Right. Is there something that ties those numbers together? And I found right. several things. Number one, the reciprocal values for those numbers shared the same property as prime numbers. What was that property? They always sum in mod nine analysis or digital root math to the number nine. Hmm. So as an example, one over seven, seven is prime. Right. One over seven equals 0.142857, and then 142857, those six digits repeat infinitely. Mm. It's creating a sine-cosine relationship. And those numbers sum to the number 27, and 2 plus 7 equals 9. So then you take a quasi-prime number, which is one of the numbers that was green. On there, I call them quasi-primes. That means they share primeness. But they're different than semi-primes because semi-primes are divisible by two and three. And they don't have this property of summing right. to nine. Right. Okay. So if I like take a number like twenty or like 35, one over 35 is 0. 0.2857, 0. 0.0285714. The same numbers summing to 27, again, coming to nine. And of course, that's divisible by five and seven. So then I posited that every number that was not red on this chart must be quasi prime and not divisible by two and three. And that's what this chart is doing in mod 24. It separates out divisibility by two and three and, and basically puts all the quasi prime numbers that are divisible only by prime numbers that are greater than three. And then these numbers have higher degrees of primeness associated with them because they act more like prime numbers. Mm. So what does this mean? Well, what it means is that we could then tie to it a relationship between electricity and magnetism. Mm. So when you start looking at the way that you could tie that together, you'll start seeing that on one side of this, the number series is always one, four, and seven. And on the other side of the quasi-prime list, including prime numbers as well, will be two, five, and eight. And then the center of this chart will always be three, six, and nine. The blue will always be three, six, and nine. So on one of these charts, the digital roots will always be, you know, in the center, the blues are three, six, nine, or six, three, nine, or nine, three, six, or nine, six, three, right? Different permutations of it. And the same thing happens with the red and the green numbers, but now it's going to only do that with the numbers that are behind one over seven which is mm -hmm. one, four, two, eight, five, seven. Those are the only options that it could be, right? Those are the other six numbers that are not three, six, and nine in the base nine system. So I found a pattern within this. Now, because we discovered that prime numbers will always square where they're greater than three to multiples of 24 plus one, we could then use this as a method to predict primeness. Mm -hmm. Wow. So it's a primality test. It's a novel primality test. And what then that led to was an understanding that there is a geometric foundational basis to the prime number distribution, which is the subject of the Riemann hypothesis. Hmm. And we found that the prime numbers distribution is related directly to an asymptote that starts at the square root of 10 and then goes to the Euler number for its distribution. So the square root of 10 is more accurate to predict prime numbers as a logarithmic base value for any given number set than is the Euler number. It's much better up mm. until like the first 10 or so digits of numbers. And the reason is, is because Euler hasn't reached its asymptote yet, right? So it's got to mm. basically have this asymptotic kind of distribution. Well, what that said to us was that our understanding now might need to be modified of what prime numbers are. And we directly linked gravity to the numerical expressions of 1, 4, 7 and their permutations. And we directly linked magnetism to 2, 5, and 8. 
let me let me ask you a question. And by the way, the square root of the gravitational constant, which is 6.67408, that's the gravitational constant. The square root of it is 258. 2.583. So wait a minute. And then that, if we take its square root, comes down to what's called the quantum Hall effect. So wait, there might actually be a numerical number theory approach to crossing this chasm of what we consider, you know, strong force versus weak force in physics. And yes, absolutely. Maybe there's another imaginary plane simply of how we look at the scaling of numbers. So numbers that are 10 to the negative one, if you actually look at it and say, wait, if there's actually a negative one that acts more like an imaginary plane, then what that would actually tell you is that gravity would become extraordinarily powerful hmm. at micro scales and remain extraordinarily weak at macro scales. And the opposite would be true for magnetism, which is exactly what happens when we can't explain the differential between strong force and, and weak force and strong force and gravity. So that's why we were trying to solve the prime number pattern, not because I was trying to find a prime number pattern just for fun, right? <laughs> it's like a big, big game of Sudoku. Right, right. And then we realized that the foundational basis of prime distribution and logarithms is actually right triangles. And those right triangles are defining their logarithmic base values through polygonal references that are based upon the hypotenuse over the height of the right triangle. And that serves as a logarithmic base value for elliptic curves, for everything. So from that, we were able to predict the exact speed of hurricanes based on the tightness or their pitch of their spiral, because wow. we could know that it was going to be a certain modular spiral formation. We could look at a satellite photograph and without knowing anything other than that, we could tell you the speed of the hurricane on the ground with accuracy, very, very high wow. accuracy, because it was not the Euler number that was making these spirals. It plays a role in it for sure, but it was basic polygons. And that was another paper we published uh, that was titled um, Novel Classification for Geometric Spirals, Polygonal Geometric Spiral Formations. And we, we associate it with galaxies uh, and spiral galaxies. We were able to match every single one to what polygon it was. So then it gives us hidden information about the structure of space-time mm. looking like a spider's web of a geometric polygonal shape that is simply inscribed within another and inscribed within another infinitely both directions. And yep. that started to really open our eyes on a lot of different things. And, and, and solving prime numbers then led to the realization that even prime factorization, which is supposed to be the hardest thing to solve in mathematics is really just a representation of the sum and the product and the difference of two parental numbers. And those two numbers are X and Y. You know, the, the height of a right triangle will be the geometric mean of X and Y. So the geometric mean is simply X times Y taken to their square root function. And then the arithmetic mean is X plus Y divided by two or multiplied by one half. So where the universe is looking at the height of a triangle, it will always do this. And this is true for every triangle that is a right triangle without exception. And even scaling triangles can be made into less, you know, smaller right triangles. So basically what it says is that the universe says the height of a right, right triangle is going to be X multiplied by Y taken to the power of one half. And the hypotenuse will always be X plus Y multiplied by one half. And this is how the universe does it. And then the base value will always be y minus x multiplied by one half. So can you create this universe just on right triangles? Yes, 100%. And this means then you could start looking at this from the perspective of, as Einstein predicted, that he didn't say geometry and space-time geometry is described by the mathematics and geometry that we have. He said that geometry is gravity. Hmm. This is an inherency that the very fundamental Newtonian classical way of looking at gravity and electromagnetism, they share one characteristic that nobody can deny, 
and that at the, the macro scales, but then somehow it falls apart at the micro scales, which is the inverse square law. The inverse square law falls apart at micro scales, but it holds entirely intact at macro scales, at all scales. And, you know, the universe is a self-similar fractal that, that replicates itself in both directions infinitely. How is it that all of a sudden what we call gravity and electromagnetism falls apart entirely? We have to now replace it with some concept called strong force. Maybe a more simple approach would be to look at it and say, isn't there a different way of looking at square and square root functions below the number one? Have you ever noticed how when you have a number like, you know, nine squared is 81, but 0.9 squared is 0.81. So 81 is larger than nine, but 0.81 is smaller right. than 0.9. And we actually ran the math on this, and it actually closes the gap between strong and strong force and gravity. So we posit another imaginary plane at scales of magnitude. So wait a minute. Could it really be this simple? Maybe. You know, we also wrote a paper called Fractal Rooting of Numbers. And what is a fractal root? It's when you realize that every number has more than one square root value. Mm. So the universe doesn't really care so much in our research about the decimal point. Okay. So for example, if I take the square root of pi, it comes out to 1.772, right? That's the square root of pi. But what if I gave you the fractal root of pi? The fractal root of pi is two numbers separated by 10 times where they're the exact same numbers. So 5.60499 times 0.560499 equals 3.14159262535. So it's a new way to square numbers, and this works at all scales. It works with all cubes. It works with the fourth power, the fifth power, sixth power, seventh power, eighth power. It doesn't matter. It goes forever. We wrote a paper on this. It are are we living in a simulation? <laughs> okay. My, 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 my I was wondering when you were going to finally right ask me that. I, I was, I was planning to ask, but yeah, let's get, let's get into that because that's, that is my natural next question. I believe the answer is yes. Unequivocally. Yes. And can you clarify for, 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 for our audience out there? So if yes, what does it mean? What, what does that mean? What, what is a simulation? What does that look like? Well, first of all, what is what the definition? What's the definition of a matrix? It's, it's always a mathematical construct. Right. Right? It's a matrix. It's like a scaffolding. And that matrix of the universe, the only thing that we have denied that has led us to believing in this falsehood that we call materialism um, is that we have failed to objectively analyze what is space. Is space really empty? Mm. And that's a bigger question. Does light really travel? I'll give you an example of what I mean. Let's say we're at a football game and there's a wave going through the stadium. So everybody, when the wave energy comes around to you, you stand up and sit down and go, whoa, and then sit down, right? And then you watch the wave travel around the stadium until it comes back around to you and you stand up again. So you have two positions. One position is on excitation. The other one is off excitation, sitting down again. Are you traveling around the stadium? No. The energy perturbation of the wave is traveling around the stadium. Mm. So let's, let's take this to water. And wave mechanics work the same in everything. Let's take this to water. So there's a big earthquake in Japan. In 2011, there was in Fukushima. And I remember in the coastal California, we saw large waves because we got like tornado. Not, it was... Uh, it was uh, uh, tsunami warnings, right? Tsunami warnings on the waves coming over from Japan. So I remember thinking, wait, does this mean that the water that came all the way over across the Pacific Ocean, you know, 3,000 plus miles, was the water that originated in Japan? <laughs> and of course, that doesn't make any sense. And so, no, the water in Japan remained in Japan. It just right. went through its on excitation what and off means. excitation. As the wave perturbation of energy found its way through that medium. This is true for everything. 
But now we immediately think in physics, oh, light has to travel, and therefore there must be no medium in a vacuum. Hmm. Even though we recognize that in air, sound seeks a medium. Right, right. And the more dense the medium, the speed of sound increases. Right. So, for example, the speed of sound in air is 343 meters per second. Right. But the speed of sound in water is 1,440 meters per second. The speed of sound through granite, which is what the King's Chamber and the Great Pyramids made out of, is 6,000 meters per second. Wow. So the differential in speed between air for sound and granite, one of the densest materials on the planet, is 17 and a half times. That's a huge variance. Yeah. So what if light were just the opposite of that? We already know that, that sound carries phonons, right? And phonons carry mass. Hmm. So phonons of sound carry mass. This was proven in a Scientific American publication. It came out two years ago. So could it be that sound is really somehow related to light and we're just not seeing the connection? There are a lot of people that posit in physics that there must be some linkage between light and its dark photon opposite pairing, just as an electron has a positron that basically is entangled through time. And then when they finally meet each other, they annihilate each other in a gamma photon burst that becomes gamma photon annihilation. And then we call that moment the moment of now. So when we start thinking about it from that perspective, then we say, wait a minute. If there's an opposite to everything, there's an anti-proton as well. Hmm. And we've got this balance, and everything has to have an equal opposite reaction in the universe. That's Newtonian and Einsteinian. Then shouldn't we then have some sort of opposite of what light is? And I don't just mean hmm. the absence of light. Right. Is darkness the absence of light, or is it actually the opposite condition of it? So then you start asking yourself the question, well, wait a minute. If light doesn't travel because it's really just traveling just like all other wave phenomenon as a wave perturbation of energy that's mm -hmm. passing through a medium, then there must also be some medium within the vacuum. Right. And this is what it had posited all the way through the 19th century and early 20th century, this notion of an ether, a luminiferous ether. This is what Nikola Tesla believed as well. And when you start digging deeper into this, you start realizing that what we thought was material is actually mental. So what do I mean by that? Well, the latest Nobel Prize that was just given was awarded for quantum entanglement. Okay. And it proved local realism is false. So in other words, if no one's actually observing something, you could surmise that whatever that thing is no longer holds a position and actually sits as a wave function. So until you observe it, which then the moment you observe something, it snaps into what we would call in term a wave collapse into a particle. Mm -hmm. So you could think of this just like one over X in their number series. So you've got 1 over x, which creates a sine-cosine wave, especially for prime numbers, and they've got these long periods of repetition. It literally creates mm -hmm. a, a wave of expression that's infinite. Right. right. Until we observe something, and then bang, it becomes a discrete particle value. Is the world around us really just x and 1 over x? Wow. And we're in a cycle of repetition yeah. of that repetition cycle until we finally wake up to the fact that we are actually in a simulation. So, you know, I, I, I'm curious about your thoughts on how math can contribute to happiness, because right now, you know, the more I, the more I know, I know. 
the more I understand that how miserably small I know. So yeah, yeah, that's and, my and favorite makes... thing. Is like the more I learn, the less I actually know. So yeah. <laughs> we share that one. You know, we definitely share that feeling. Um, so why would why why would we subject ourselves to a simulation? Because I I think that we ultimately choose it all. So then you start asking yourself the question, okay, what would be the reasonable thesis for why mankind would subject themselves to a simulation? Right. So then you start thinking, okay, well, I'm infinite. I'm omnipotent. I'm omniscient. So a simulation that actually leveraged all of my abilities wouldn't be very fun. Hmm. It, it, you, the only way that you could conceive of a game that's going to be interesting and fun is to realize that to play it, you have to limit your abilities. Mm. And it would be no fun at all if you could remember why you created it. The whole thing is to come here to learn through experience. And just like working out requires you to tear muscles at times to make them stronger, Breaking your spirit sometimes strengthens it and makes it more resilient. Breaking your heart might actually increase your capacity to love. Okay. So what if we created a simulation that was like a simulation of duality? That the way we can learn about concepts like pain or concepts like pleasure or love, all the things we would want to learn, forgiveness, right. compassion, unconditional love, we would have to experience not through a didactic classroom setting, but experience in a way that it's experiential because that's going to stick the most. And it also serves another thing. What if that's actually serving the purpose of the overall universe itself? which is to gather all the possible different subjective perspectives to mm -hmm. increase its record of emotional states, which emotions are derived from our perception of our reality. And no one will ever see the world like we do as individuals ever again, or has ever seen it that way in the past either. Right. So we're adding unique perspectives of input that then build a larger and larger field of information so the universe can expand. Robert, what are the benefit of, let's say, let's say one of our, somebody is listening to this. Let's just say for, in this case, because our audience, we have a lot of teachers, let's say I'm a teacher, Robert, fantastic. This has been very compelling. I agree. We are in a simulation. What can I take away from this though? Should I leave? With, with with peace like should i you, you know like should that make me should should I leave? peace like, out right? bitches right it's like, like i'm out should i should i be happy after this conversation yes and why yes, be because here's the beauty of it because it is actually very beautiful the purpose we are here i believe is to learn through opposites until we no longer judge those opposites negatively, we have not learned the concept yet. So what do I mean by this? So we've all experienced situations where we've been through very difficult circumstances at some mm -hmm. point in time or another. And we've said, oh, that was so bad. I'm going through hell right now. This is terrible. Right. But then how many times a year, two years, three years, maybe four or five years down the road, can you look back and say, you know what? It felt like hell at the time, but actually that experience was the best thing that ever happened to me because it led to this. Yep. So Solid. many times. Yep. So really what we're experiencing is just an illusion of the pain because actually all the learning comes through the pain. No pain, no gain. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. As I look Does back on my high school years. Does it mean that we should expose to more pain now, to more pain? <laughs> well, yeah, look, here's the thing, right? I'm, I'm, I was not a mountain climber, but if I were a mountain climber, 
I wouldn't want to be happy climbing the hill behind my house. Mm. I want to push myself to the max. Right. I'm going to go after Mount Everest, even though I know that there's dead frozen bodies that basically populate the side of that mountain at the top near the summit. I'm going to risk it all. And then if I die, I might come back and say, I'll do it next time. Damn it. I'm going to come back. <laughs> it might even change my perspective on how I would like to die. Maybe I'd want to have as many experiences as I possibly could. Hmm. You know, in the beginning, it's like, oh, I want to die making love to the love of my life. That was great for like three times. And then after that, you know, I want to die in a fiery cataclysm, right? In like a James Bondian style freaking explosion. <laughs> It changes our entire perspective. And more importantly, the things that we choose as our challenges in life, our struggles, are not going to be the same as what other people would choose. So why should we judge what other people should want to have chosen? Right. When Robert, it's all Maya. I want to ask you, and th this has been such a fascinating interview. Your passion literally screams through the mic. I mean, seriously, it has been an absolute pleasure for the past hour. I think we can spend like one year just speaking with you because you're such an interesting person. And it's funny because I, I, I know you didn't see the notes, but we literally had like, I think 10 questions. We got through one question, but I will ask you <laughs> one last question. That's that, this, this is how Go amazing, this is how amazing this was, but I'll ask you one last question to wrap it up. Uh, mm -hmm. which is, and it's, 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 it's not going to be a, a, a very, it's not going to be a mathematical question. It's a simple okay. question, mm -hmm. which is, uh, who has been the most inspiring, uh, person in your life and what lessons have you learned from them? You know, I don't think I would have said this until now. Okay. But I have. And you're probably thinking, wait, that's a very insular way of looking at the world, Robert. Maybe. But I don't believe that the world's a difficult place because people hate each other. I think the world becomes a very difficult place because people hate themselves. Mm -hmm. If there's one thing that this path has chosen me, it is to learn to fall in love with this place as it is. And... I, I cannot emphasize that to you enough because we all get stuck in this belief that the world is, the universe is happening to us in some negative way. What right. if we just considered for a moment that actually it's all happening for us? And we just don't have the benefit of the retrospective view of time to see how it benefits us just yet. So we have to have patience. I'm at a time right now in my life where I had a very, very difficult time in 2016. And now it's, you know, it's been seven years. Every cell in your body changes in seven years. Did you know that? There's not a single cell that was alive yeah. seven years ago in your body today. That means your entire body is made new. The yeah. only reason why we age is because we're making copies of copies of copies of those cells. And the image degrades. Right. But if I could force you to believe or you're at a biological standpoint that your body is sick, I can actually force your body, I can trick it into creating repair enzymes and macrophage sort of responses such that your body will believe that you're sick. Mm -hmm. Just by injecting your own broken DNA back into your bloodstream, I can lengthen your telomeres again. You can lengthen them. Lengthen them. Okay. They shorten with time generally, right? Right, right. right. So I can lengthen them. This is a fact. This is what right. happens when we use like starvation on rats, on lab rats. They think they're sick. So as soon as they start eating too much, then they start aging rapidly again. But as soon as you starve them, their bodies think they're sick. And so they go into sort of this survival mode and then they lengthen their telomeres again. Yeah. So what's that all about? Right. What, what we're experiencing, if every cell in my body is entirely new in seven years. Right then I should have entirely different perspectives on how I see the world in seven years. And for me, seven years ago, I had this crisis. And now seven years later, I'm coming full circle. And that full circle 
has shifted everything for me. I used to think that even though I've had a successful life and everything and, and, you know, I tried my best and all that stuff. And yes, it is absolutely true. The more I learned, the less I actually know. All those things are true. But now, for the first time in my life, I actually look at my life and I feel like I was always and have always been what I've been looking for. Wow. All the things that we look to in other people as mentors, and I've had many along the way. But I think I've finally reached a point in my life where I feel like I can be my own now. Well, that's very, that's probably the most powerful thing I've heard come out of somebody's mouth to date, honestly. Well, thanks for asking, because no one's ever asked it to no. me before. And I don't think I would have given that answer just until now. You know, I, I look back on my life now with such deep gratitude. I am grateful for all the challenges I faced. I'm meeting with someone tomorrow who badly, badly betrayed me. And they're coming and asking for apologies. And this is happening a lot lately. And I, I don't feel any animus towards him or, or them. Mm -hmm. Zero. In fact, if anything, I feel gratitude. Yeah. You know, when I think back to junior high school, the teachers that were easy in my classes were not the ones I even remember their names. Yeah. The yep. ones that pushed me in ways that I never thought I could be pushed or believe that I could excel in ways that I never believed myself. Yeah. Are the ones that I remember the most as having the biggest impact on my life. Yeah. And to me, that's the way I look at the biggest challenges in my life. Those things that test me the most, it really is true. What doesn't kill us does make us stronger. Yeah. Robert, this has been an absolute pleasure. This conversation has been very enlightening. The answer you just gave to us has been the best answer. I, I probably have to... I'm going to get off this now and think about that answer, actually, and reflect upon it. Uh, for for our listeners who are listening, we didn't even grasp uh, a, a, a lot of the content. Robert is incredible. So for, for those of you who want to check out, Robert has books, Philomath and Polymath. Uh, Robert has his own podcast uh, for more stimulating conversations. Follow him on his social media, which is at Robert Edward Grant. That's R-O-B-E-R-T. Edward, that's E-D-W-A-R-D, -E Grant. And uh, please be sure to check out his website. His website has incredible content. Sur uh, browsing it uh, uh, today earlier today, that is robertedwardgrant.com. Robert, thank you so much for thank sharing Thank you so time much, guys. And, and keep inspiring kids. Keep inspiring them. That's the thing. You know, our youth in this country needs inspiration. And that inspiration shouldn't be self-serving. It should be, you know, about them and boosting them up because it's a hard world out there right now. Lots of questions. People just don't even know who they are right now. Yeah. And, and I, I really commend teachers who, who provide that inspiration to our youth uh, because that's what's going to matter. You know, people are not going to remember what you taught them. Right. But what they will remember is how you made them feel. That's a Maya Angelou quote. And I absolutely believe that. So inspire them, motivate them. You'll have a much bigger impact on their lives than if they remember this differential, you know, you know, <laughs> linear algebra equation or something. Right. Right. Yeah. Thanks so much. I think right now we will leave interview with more questions. <laughs> than answers. We'll, we'll leave with more questions than answers. That is absolutely correct. 